Um, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Dube, and I work for Grassroots Soccer. And in our session today, we'll be exploring meaningful youth engagement and the use of youth-centered um, design um, as we adapted our um, sexual and reproductive health programs throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have panelists from Grassroots Soccer, IU.org and Youth Empowerment and Development Initiative, um, Yedi in short, who will be sharing best practices and experiences um, on meaningful youth engagement. Right. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so Grassroots Soccer is an adolescent health organization and traditionally we've used um, a sport-based approach and an in-person approach. Um, and we've been doing this since 2002, and we work in about 50 different countries, and we've reached over 2 million youth. But then COVID hit, and I think like a lot of organizations, we, we, there was an initial panic, you know, how will we do sport-based programming and in-person programming when that's not possible? Um, but I think after the panic subsided a bit, uh, we realized we had the opportunity to, to really innovate and to, to work with young people to give them something that, that they wanted. Um, that really worked for them. So we did two main things um, to keep our programming going and, and hopefully improve it. One was we, um, we developed some new delivery channels to deliver our um, sexual and reproductive health material. And then we also, uh, the second main approach is we actually developed a, a COVID curriculum that could be delivered remotely. So the new delivery channels, we, we, the, the two main ones was we, in Zambia, we developed what we call five aside, which are small conference calls with, with groups of young people, five to 10, five to 10 young people um, where they're receiving the uh, curriculum over the phone. And then the second main approach was a soccer based magazine, which we piloted in Zimbabwe, which took all the, the main um, content from the curriculum and made it in a fun um, sport based magazine. And in terms of youth engagement, both of those uh, approaches were generated by youth themselves uh, through our participants, through our coaches, going out and asking young people, what is an effective way to, to work with you and do this, this programming? In Zimbabwe, the magazine, really interesting, the, the young people themselves, they said they wanted something that could help them talk to their parents. Uh, so we, we integrated that into the magazine. And then our second main approach is uh, we made an open source COVID-19 curriculum. So using a, a grassroots soccer methodology, uh, we created three really simple sessions on, um, on uh, COVID knowledge and prevention, and we made it all free and open. Um, it's been downloaded and implemented in 35 countries. Um, and it was a design sprint, so we worked really fast, but engaging youth was, was really important. Through, through each iteration, we've heard from, from young people. Um, our first draft, we had a mental health, uh, mental well-being session. And they found it really confusing and not that beneficial. Uh, so we, we worked with that feedback and really cut it down and made it, made it useful. And it turned out to be one of the sessions that they enjoyed the most. And then uh, another way that we worked with youth um, is we've, we just found out how it was being implemented because it was open source, it was a new form for us. And we found a number of them had, um, had made songs and anthems about hand washing, about preventing COVID. And, and um, through our assessment, we actually got to hear and see them sing a lot of these songs. Uh, so we were able to integrate that back into the curriculum. Because when we started this, we had no idea like songs and anthems would be so important. Uh, so just to pick it up from what um, Jeff has, has just been saying, I think when the, when the pandemic hit, um, <laughs> it was a, how would the young people be involved? How do we continue implementing these programs um, as an organization? And, how can we keep the coaches busy? And I think for me, I have divided it in four parts just to explain how it was adapting and how the five-a-side curriculum works in general. So the first thing I think he, he's touched on that. So it's in smaller groups and you're having, as a coach, you're having an interaction with five people and those five people, be it girls from the skills girl curriculum, boys from skills board or skills school, which encompasses both girls and boys between the ages of 10 to 14, are at liberty to choose the time that is preferred for them, the time they're available to have the sessions. And I think that was really helpful on the participants part. And secondly, um, parents' involvement, especially for those under skills school, because 
participants between the ages of 10 to 14 mostly use their parents' phones or their guardians' phones. And this gave us an involvement of the parents being able to participate in the sessions and being able to listen in. Other thing is it strengthens social networks and interactions beyond sexual reproductive health sessions because after the intervention, we're able to create a WhatsApp group for the participants or they're able to reach out to me as a coach where they can ask questions through the WhatsApp group or through messages. And beyond that, we have what we call teen groups or teen clubs. And there's, there's a specific curriculum for that as well. And then, so it just went beyond just having the normal SRHR sessions through our curriculums, but it went beyond having other sessions as well where participants can easily just reach out to you. And it also expanded our program reach and the consistency in attendance. So doing it virtually via phone calls, it was easy for me to even reach out to participants who are in other provinces because I'm based in Lusaka, Zambia, but virtually I could reach to participants that are in, in the Copperbell province and in Wapula. And that way we were able to reach participants from far provinces. And then there was also just, it created that vital conversation and safe spaces amongst the participants and amongst and strengthen the relationship between me and the participants because I'm only having five participants on a particular call. And then that creates a safe space. I'm able to have a vital conversation with them. And me and the participants are able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation because then I'm only dealing with a group of five people. Yeah. Um, when the pandemic first hit last year and the country experienced its first lockdown, we had to change course from a scheduled in-house attendance makeathon that we had planned to hosting a three-week design sprint with HCD Exchange, Epigo, Maisha Youth, and In Their Hands to explore how we might help adolescents get access to the sexual and reproductive health information and the support they need in a physically distant and disrupted world. Um, so the first week, we brainstormed the ideas with the partners that I've mentioned. The second week, we, we built the rough prototypes and um, we used the partner networks with the youth ambassadors that they worked with in the various communities that they implemented their programs. They had such a vast network of youth that we were able to tap into and get feedback on the prototypes. <clears throat> and then the last week we used it to um, iterate the concept and push it to a higher fidelity. So the end result was an open resource for the adolescent and um, youth sexual and reproductive health community to access self-care content for adolescents. The assets range from downloadable self-care audio and visual assets that can be shared with adolescents. Um, it gathered the voices of providers answering FAQs that we collected during those prototyping sessions. Um, young people giving testimonials on self-care products, what their experiences were, good or bad, and conversations between young people that, that might help spark dialogue um, amongst their peers. So voice up which is the name of the of the of the output that we that we had at the end of the design sprint it helps partners find uh, youth friendly services near them and even offers them inspiration for other global programming in self care um, during the prototyping phase, we also collected insights that helped direct the choice of assets. So as you've heard, we had audio visual assets. Um, so for example, we chose audio formats to be more inclusive of a low literacy audience and also versatile enough to be shared across different platforms because we all know how youth engage with different mediums. Um, we also designed assets that could be organic, so anyone can help contribute to and scale the, the product. So from our inaugural sprint and through VoiceUp, which is the concept that, that we have that's launched um, on voiceup.com, we would like to encourage continued collaboration amongst partners and youth that result in authentic and sustainable products and services. Yeah. Prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus disease in 2019, we at EAD, that is the Youth Empowerment Development Initiative, we deliver evidence-based curricula with 10 practices that are age-appropriate and gender-specific. We do this in schools and in communities. However, as a result of uh, you know, 
the outbreak of the pandemic with it and the country experienced its first uh, lockdown. And this also resulted into, you know, shutdown of schools and prohibition of gatherings. And uh, yeah, prohibition of gatherings were also enforced. So in response to the pandemic, uh, I think Jeff mentioned uh, the GRS part, the, 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 the design the COVID-19 response curriculum virtually to support social distancing messaging and other healthy practices required to halt the continued spread of the virus. So we, we, yeah, we adapted this COVID-19 response curriculum and incorporated key messages into the curriculum that we have facilitated in person. And together with the help of our near peer educators, our skills coaches, we were able to also develop an abridged version of this to be facilitated virtually. The abridged version of this skills curriculum has three practices and it harbors sessions on COVID-19 preventive measures, malaria prevention, as well as HIV. So uh, the skills coaches suggested the appropriate information that young people, which are participants, might be interested in. And they also suggested that these sessions should be delivered virtually via WhatsApp. So after this has been concluded, and we uh, have that network set out by the young near peer educators themselves, we now commence our skills COVID-19 curriculum through its exist through our existing youth coaches. We do this via social media channels, including Facebook and, and WhatsApp. So what we do on WhatsApp is that, uh, so we tag this uh, intervention, the skills live project, the skills live project. So we meet three times in a week, between, between Monday to Saturday, the young people, uh, as a result of uh, our intervention with them, we make them ambassadors in this project. So they were the one that suggested uh, the adequate timing that will be required and the timing that would also favor each participant. So a participant might want to come in in the morning session, other participants might be available in the afternoon session and other might be in the evening session. So we had three varieties of sessions that young people can benefit from. So we set out on this course, we train our coaches on the use of this GRS response COVID-19 curriculum. And then we also had uh, another training for all the staff that will be involved in terms of monitoring and also providing support for these coaches on their various enclosed WhatsApp group. So, uh, so that was how we did when the pandemic hit because before then we used to have a physical intervention, but now there's also a need for us to reach out to young people, making use of uh, virtual, uh, interventions, so we make use of WhatsApp. So the WhatsApp was on a closed group where 10 people would be reached by each coach and they'll facilitate uh, the question. So all selected coaches were trained to deliver the curriculum. So uh, each coach is to reach 10 participants per week and facilitate three practices in three days in a week. So all these coaches were selected based on their, they also give us criteria that we should use to select their near peer educators, which was really interesting for us as well. So some of the criteria were that each every coach must have an accessible and a functional smartphone before you can be selected to work on that course. And you must also have the willingness to reach about 10 people in a week. Could you each briefly share one learning or best practice on how youth can be meaningfully engaged in programs adaptation or implementation processes during um, this COVID-19 pandemic? The feedback is always the same. They love engaging in the design process. They find it efficient, effective, and exciting to tackle challenging problems they work on. And they find it really interesting how we go from ideation to actually prototyping something that can very quickly become tangible in their world. Um, so the best practice from the last two design sprints that we've had, we've had two now in the Billion Girls collab, is very simple. Listen to the youth and acknowledge them. They know what they want, they know what they need, they are very cognizant of the challenges they face and those they would like addressed. They have great ideas and they need to feel a sense of ownership. You see, the human center design approach is very unique in its own way. And uh, we've also taken away a lot of learning from it uh, as, as an organization. Uh, so one key learning and best practice we were able to take away is very imperative to ensure a human-centered approach by involving the young people in the planning phase of the program. So uh, at some point when we, didn't, when we forgot to 
acknowledge and involve our young people. We set our target age range to be nine, 10 to 10, 10 to 19. But after consulting our near peer educators, we had to restructure our target age to young people that age between 10 to 24 years as a recommendation from our skills coaches and our near peer educators. So the suggestion came and they said this that because coaches, uh, they said this because they feel people of this age range are more likely to have a functional mobile device compared to our initial target. So you could see, and that was a turning phase for us in our program design approach. So we had to involve them at every point or at every point in time. So that's one key learning we took away from our own uh, design methodology. Um, I, th I think for me, like um, learning adaptation and implementation of involving young people for me has been being a youth myself. I'm actually really glad to say that um, it uh, Grass to Talker has been making sure that young people are involved in making sure that grass, um, young people also adapt to the new way of, of, of learning or the new way of doing um, the activities. I have been involved in a number of um, curriculum reviews right here, um, Grass to Talker, Zambia, Lusaka, and that speaks to youth involvement in implementation of um, activities and curriculum. And that aside, I have um, shared personal stories stories and I have written a few articles, uh, one which was published in the newsletter. Uh, sometime last year, again, we had an art project where we had to involve both coaches and participants as well with regards to just writing stories on how they've been adapting during the COVID-19 pandemic. And those that used um, art through drawings and those that used music and short films and the other person had to use spoken word. One of the most important things in our process uh, when we're applying human design, human centered design principles, it, it, it's quite simple, but you have to get out there and try it with people. You know, before you do a randomized control trial, before you scale, essentially, um, you have to find out if it's fun, if the young people like it. Um, and and I, I mean, I can't, I was just saying on a call, I can't believe how often I see programs that are scaled but they never tested it at first to see if young people actually like it. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm in charge of curriculum for grassroots soccer, but honestly, nine out of every 10 ideas I have for curriculum fail and they fail really badly. And the only way to get to that one is to get out there and, and, and work with young people, see what they like, what they don't like, um, to get those scenarios exactly right, like, like Kunda mentioned. Uh, what are the scenarios that matter to them? I remember, uh, Dennis, you telling me when we were writing the COVID curriculum about um, uh, what do you do if uh, you're in a queue and someone in front of you is, is coughing a lot and not wearing a mask. And that, that made it into the curriculum. That was, a, that was a very pertinent scenario. That was very relevant to what was going on. My other point is one that, that we're trying to get better at is sort of completing that feedback loop. So once we design a program, once we implement it, once we get data back, going back to those same young people and saying, this thing that you helped us create, it has, it has reached 35 countries or millions of young people, or guess what? It didn't really work and we'd like to find out why. Um, so I think completing that feedback loop, not just, not just taking information from them and, and then being on our way, but coming back and saying, here's, uh, all the all that effort, all that energy, all that wisdom that you gave us. Here's how we used it. It's tough because you know you get busy and, and you're on to the next project. But I think bringing it back and, and sharing with those same young people is really important. Thank you so much, guys. Um, those are really great learnings and best practices. And I th I think for me the the important um, best practice is ensuring that um, young people are meaningfully engaged in adaptation processes and implementation processes to ensure that programs remain relevant to, to young people. Thank you so much for that.